So, my question for us today, and essentially the message is going to be this. All right, I've got three things that I just want to share with you as a church that I believe we can apply to our lives as individuals as well. Sound good? Yes. So three things, and, and, and we're doing this kind of in the middle of talking about why we, why we exist as a body, right? We've got a new mission statement that we're, uh, that, we're bringing, that we're bringing up to speed, and we've been preaching through this for the last six weeks, and it's to know, love, and follow Jesus and help others do the same. Right? So we spent three weeks talking about knowing Jesus. We spent three weeks on loving Jesus and what that looks like. And today we're starting to talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus. What is that? And so as we do that, as we kick this off, my question for you is this. Who are my leaders and who are my followers? Right? So are you a better follower or a better leader? Right? So who are my, who are my leaders? Who are the, just a the natural born your natural born leader, people follow you, you say this is the direction we're going, and people line up, right, to say yes, take me to your leader, right? A um, little Newsboys reference from the 90s, okay. Uh, and and, and who, are just the, who are just the natural followers? Like, I don't want to make decisions, like you just tell me what I'm eating, where I'm going, like I don't want to mess anything up, right? I I just want to be in line. I'm just a natural follower. All right, somebody up in the sound booth is like, that's me, that's me. Okay, thank you, Dave. I see that hand. All right. Um, the, The truth is, as I was thinking through this and praying through this, though, the truth is, the reality is, is that each and every one of us in the room have to be both at at least one time in our lives. Right? That no matter what, the, 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 the most powerful leader in the, in the world, the most powerful leader in an environment, in a situation, right? They've got somebody above them. They've got someone to follow. Right? And the most natural follower in the room, the person, at some point, you've got to lead yourself for the benefit of, the, for, of everyone around you to the bathroom to brush your teeth. Right? At some point, you have to take the initiative and make a decision that I'm going to lead in this direction, and I'm going to lead in this step, and I'm going to lead here. At some point, we've got to do that. As I was thinking about, and some of you have heard this story, but as I was thinking about a story where I've followed, because I'm a natural leader, I like, I like making decisions, I like having everyone at the end of my decisions come and say, wow, that was amazing right? You just, your decision making, top notch, unbelievable, right? I would go to the wall, you know, I, I mean, just unreal, right? Which I know is what all of you are thinking this morning as you're just looking around here. Unbelievable, Travis. Unbelievable. Great decision to minimize the parking. Unbelievable, Travis. Unbelievable. I got to park across the street and get some extra steps in on the way into church this morning. Thank you, Pastor Travis, for your decision making in that. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? It just feels good. Right? It just feels good and and it's amazing. Right? Um, But I remember in 2019, uh, my family and I went to the Grand Canyon. And we had lined up, and again, some of you have heard this story, but many of you have not. And so those of you that have heard it, buckle your seatbelt. Okay? Right? And keep quiet for the punch line, okay? But we were, but but we had we had arranged for, because some of us wanted to zip line at the Grand Canyon, right? And I, I love that stuff, right? And so the way it worked out was I was going to go zip lining alone, and then some other family members were going to go zip lining later because we couldn't go go all at once because not everybody wanted to do it. And we couldn't leave those behind. You get the point, okay? And so I go for my zip lining reservation. And there were clouds out there, but I kind of felt like Arizona was Florida, like it rains every day at least for 10 minutes and then it goes away, right? That's the nature of Florida, right? But um, so I go and I, and I walk in. Now, be nice, okay? Be nice. There was a weight limit to zip line over the Grand Canyon. And I knew going into this, now we were on a cross-country road trip, so I had been in vacation mode, otherwise known as eat everything in front of you mode, right, for about two weeks now. And so I hadn't weighed on purpose for a couple weeks because I was in vacation mode, right? 
And, and so I knew going into this trip when Kristen made the reservation that I was going to be a question mark for zipline in the Grand Canyon. And I figured it was going to depend on the person that was looking at that number when I stood on the scale as to whether or not I was going to go ziplining over the Grand Canyon. And so I hop up on, they, they, and, and what was funny is that, I mean, kind of funny, sad, I've talked to a lot of counselors about this to get to the point where I can call it funny. Um, but there, were, there, were, there was a school group, or like a youth group in, in front of me. They didn't weigh any of them. And then like I got there and she's like, scale. Now, didn't ask me like what my weight was. Scale. Now. And so I hop up on the scale, and she looks at it, and she looks at me, and like I, I kind of get like stick my bottom lip out a little bit, like please, like I really want to do this. I know you've over-engineered this thing. I know you have a number that really means nothing. Like let's just do this thing, okay? And and she looks back at me, and she says, "Let me get my manager." <laughs> now here's the thing: if you've got to let somebody down, just do it. Okay, just do it, right? Just do it. Don't go get the manager to do it. So I, I stand over in the corner. The manager comes back, and uh, he says, Sir, are you the one that needs to be weighed? And I said, Apparently. And he said, Okay, get up on a scale. So I get up on the scale. He looks at it. He looks back at me. He looks down at it. He, lo he gets on his walkie-talkie out to the tower and says, How's the wind today on the tower? And I'm a, a, inside now, I'm like, okay, abort. Maybe this is not a memory that I need to take right with me. Maybe this is not an experience that I'm just meant to experience. Like, like he's asking about the wind. What does that have to do with anything? And he hears back a, a numbers, things I could not uh, uh, make sense of or understand. And then he looks up at me and he says, you should be okay. <laughs> now, in any other situation like this, I would turn to my wife, Kristen, who was just up here a few moments ago. I would turn to her and say, what do you think? She wasn't there. Right? She wasn't there. I was alone and I was about to, I was about to, to bet my life on this guy's, you should be okay. Determined by the wind. Whatever direction that was blowing, however hard it was blowing, I was, I was heading that direction. So I, I walked through the motions. I'm starting to put on the harness. Praying. God, your will be done. On earth, on this line, as it is in heaven. I might see you soon. Right? I'm just on the inside. I'm like back and forth. Do I go? Do I fake a sickness? Do I, like, what? And then God intervened. It thundered. <laughs> and the guy looked at me and said, we're on a two-hour wait limit. I took that harness off as fast as I could. <laughs> I boarded the bus back to Kristen. There was a hailstorm that hit us for about 20 minutes with Kristen and the kids, and I hugged them so tight, saying, the Lord saved me. Because in my stupidity, I was going to go with this guy's, you should be okay. And make a decision and leadership that I should have never made. And he's like, okay, dumb dumb, I'm going to cause this thunder to bail you out of this. It's not your time. You've got to preach May 14th of 2023. I need you there. Sometimes God has to bail us out of our own stupidity, amen? And so the, the definition of follow, as we talk about following Jesus, is to go or to come after a person or a thing preceding it, right? To go or to come after. I love the, I love the action words there and the definition of follow, to go, right? Because some of us have the idea of following as sitting, 
right? And sometimes there's a season for that, but really, indeed, to follow, it means to take action, right? It means to take action. And so whether we are leading or following, we're moving, right? We're moving. And so um, three things I want to tell you this morning. The first is this. As a church, in order to make our mark as Summit, but as you as an individual, if you're here today for the child dedication, if you're here today because it's our first Sunday and you just, you just wanted to be here and show your support, hallelujah, thank you. But this is for you as an individual as well. Pray for His presence and seek His glory. As I, as I wrestled with over the last, I, I don't know how many weeks, what do you say on this day? What do you say on this day? And I, I tried to find one passage that just would, would summarize how I felt, and I found four. And so the first one is this, Exodus chapter 33. A lot of you know it. This story comes right after the golden calf. You remember how God was leading his people in the book of Exodus? And this is really important. God was leading his people in a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And so these Israelites in the Exodus and the freedom from Pharaoh's captivity in the, in the early days of Exodus and God calls Moses by the burning bush and gives him all the signs and then Moses goes before Pharaoh and, and we know the song lyrics, right? He says, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. Yeah, 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 right? As he stands before Pharaoh, some of you know that song, some of you need to go back to Bible school, okay? And so Moses is leading these people and he's led them across the the sea on dry ground, he's, 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 they've, they've faced obstacle after obstacle, they've, but they've gotten to this place, right, where they've kind of set up camp, there's a tent of meeting where, they're, where the Ark of Covenant is, and all, all these different things, and they're setting up camp, and they're back and forth on whether or not they've made the right decision to follow Moses. And here's the reality, their leader, Moses, keeps disappearing on this mountain to meet with God by himself. And, and on occasion, he would stay up there sometimes 40 days and 40 nights. And the people would, would lose heart, and the people would start to grumble. In fact, in, in this particular case, right before we, we pick up in Exodus chapter 33, they say, as for this Moses, we don't know what's become of him. And so they gather a bunch of gold and jewelry, and they, they melt it, and they fashion this golden calf to worship, because that's a great idea, right? And God interrupts his time with Moses and says, Moses, you've got to go down and deal with the people. They're losing heart. They've made an idol to worship. And so Moses goes down and rebukes the people and sets them straight and and, and, and gets them right, and then he heads back up on the mountain to have a conversation with God. And this is where we pick up. Exodus chapter 33 is Moses' time with God right after the golden calf when the people had lost heart. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have, found, you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Now, again, Moses is the leader of this people, but he had a leader above him. Right? And I love how he kept that perspective. And even after the death of Moses, we see in Joshua chapter 1 that Joshua, who took over after Moses, followed suit and did the exact same thing. Looked to God on behalf of the people. On behalf of the people. And so whatever leadership position you hold in this room, a leader of your family, a leader in your business, a leader, in your, a leader in your company, a leader in your church, a leader, whatever leadership position you hold in this room, if you're a believer in Jesus, guess what? There's someone you follow. There's someone you follow. That's why here, 
That's why I hear I'm uncomfortable being called the senior pastor. I know that's tradition. I know a lot of you have, have, have called me that in the past, and that's, and that's what's, I think it's still in our bylaws as much as I've tried to get it out. I'm not really sure. I don't read those except for annual, at annual meeting. Um, all right. But I'm uncomfortable because I asked the question years and years ago, what does it look like if Jesus is the senior pastor of Summit Church? Because that's what we want. That's what his church should desire. Not Travis, because guess what? If Travis is gone tomorrow, Summit Church is going to be just fine. Maybe even better. Maybe even better. You get me out of the way, you could really do some things. You have some more space. You wouldn't have to worry about weight limits if you go ziplining as a church. Right? But Moses knew that. He knew the perspective. He knew, and what he's begging God for is, God, don't lead us from this place if you're not going with us. We need desperately the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And so, God, if you're abandoning us, tell me now because I'm not leaving this place. Because God, just before this, had gotten frustrated with the people and said, I'm going to wipe them all out. And Moses is like, God, not a good look. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> not a good look for you to free these people from Pharaoh's rule only to bring them out in the desert to kill them all. Not good. Let's not do that, God. Take a minute. Chill. Right? Right? And so Moses is already gone, gone on behalf of the people to save their lives. Did the people know that? No. They didn't know that, but Moses did because he had gone to bat for his people. Right? And so now he's going back up on the mountain saying, God, if you're not going to lead us from here, I'm not going. We're not going. I'm so hungry and I need your presence so bad that if you're not taking us, I'm not leading. Let me tell you something. We need that type of faith. Every day. Every day. Every day. Where we face every day on the mountain. God, if you're not going, if you're not leading, if you're not taking me, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not going. And so Moses intercedes. He prays on behalf of the people. And then, and then in verse 17... And the Lord said to Moses, notice this, notice this. And so, some people say, what's the point of praying, right? What's the point of praying? Because God's going to do what he's going to do. The point of praying is God did everything that he did in Scripture so that he could create a relationship with you, so that you could have access to him, so that he could hear your heart. That's the gospel, is that he sent Jesus that we might have access to him. It's getting hot in here. And so, and so Jesus says, ask, seek, knock. Don't stop begging God for his presence in your life. And then look at, what, look at what happens next. He says in verse 17, The Lord said to Moses, This very thing, I love this, He answers the prayer of Moses, This very thing you've spoken, I will do for you. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses takes it a step further. Pray for His presence and seek His glory. He says, Please show me your glory. Now what's Moses praying for there? He's praying for the greatness of God to be shown to him. The glory, when, when we say, God, show me your glory, we're saying, God, show me your greatness. Show me your awesomeness. The, 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 the things that words can't even describe. Show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see my face and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand in the rock. And when my glory, my greatness passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Here's what I'm convinced. Pray for the presence of God and seek his glory. Here's what I'm convinced is that some of us aren't experiencing the glory of God because we're not asking for it. 
You think it's just going to happen. You think you're just going to trip on it one day. No. We have to get on our face before God and say, God, I need you. We've got to ask. We've got to seek. We've got to keep knocking. Until God makes clear to us what it is that he's called us and led us to do. And you might sit and say, Travis, I don't even know how to do that. It's like Nike. You just do it. You just do it. This might be controversial. But like the commercial says, there's no wrong way to eat a Reese's. Some people say there is. And that's okay. Everybody's entitled to their wrong opinion. There's no wrong way to get before God with open hearts and open mind and say, God, I need you. I needed you. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Lead me from here. And don't leave until he does. The second thing I want to tell you today is this. Claim the victory from his word. Kristen Champa already read the story from David and Goliath this morning. But I want to read it to you again. It says, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated, bef- they repeated them before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now David had shown up. David wasn't even taken on the trip because they knew he was not the one to fight Goliath. Now let's talk about Goliath for just a moment. Goliath was, was said to be, history says he was nine feet nine inches tall. That's tall. Okay? I used to be six eight until I started slouching and drinking so much coffee. And now, and I don't know, I'm like six one now. <laughs> so you just picture David. And Goliath, Goliath being nine feet, nine inches tall, his armor weighed 125 pounds, carrying an appropriately sized spear and shield, right? But we all have Goliaths in our lives. We all have those things in our life that feel nine foot, nine inches tall with 125 pounds worth of armor ready to just beat us. David's finally getting Saul and the army to realize that he's the one that's going to go forward and face Goliath. And you, and you had to think that those guys were in the tent thinking, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. This is crazy. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and took and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, like you do, All right, go ahead. God be with you. God be with you. See, David knew that he could defeat anything Why? Because God had given him the strength to do it before. Some of you are here today, not because you're that good, but God has given you the strength to to face your giants before. Right? It doesn't make sense. There are a lot of things about this place and this space that don't make sense. It it doesn't. At At the end of the day, it doesn't. But God. But God. And let me spoil 
the end of it for you. God's already claimed the victory on behalf of those who believe in him. So what's left for you to do is believe. Believe. And God, help my unbelief. Help, help the humanity in me that says, this is crazy. Help the humanity in me that says, there's no way this makes sense. I mean, I had a dream last night as, as I was walking into this space at 10.05 that there were 20 people in the room. And I just kind of threw my hands up and woke up at like 2.05 thinking, yep, that's going to happen today. Right? It doesn't make sense that you're here. It doesn't make sense that we're here. If we summit, if we could tell our guests this morning the story of why we're here and how we got here, it's crazy. It's crazy. But God. And in Christ, we are promised in Scripture we're more than conquerors. It doesn't make sense that David defeated a nine foot nine giant with 125 pounds of armor. But God. And so what's the giant you're facing in your life today? A marriage on the rocks? A kid that won't stop talking back? Or a debt load that you can't fathom or figure out how you're even going to get ahead or every second you, tr you think you're getting ahead, boom, something else hits you? What's the giant you're facing today? Claim the victory over the thing from Scripture. And say, God's done it before. He'll do it again. Claim the victory from Scripture. And then number three, third thing I want to tell you today is this. Run the race with your eyes fixed on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Therefore, now this, this really goes along with what we were just talking about because if you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and then Hebrews chapter 12, we see therefore. Hebrews chapter 11, we call that the hall of faith. Right? And it's all the stories. By faith, this happened. By faith, this happened. By faith, David beat Goliath. By faith, the, 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 the mouths of lions were shut. By faith, we put foreign armies to flight. By faith, this happened. By faith, that happened. By faith. And so then we get to Hebrews chapter 12, and the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I know for some of you see the word run and you're like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> I only run when chased. Don't miss the point of the passage, family. Verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Run the race with your eyes on Jesus. Listen to me. Every person in this room, you have a race to run. Summit Church, we have a race to run. This is not a finish line. Don't get comfortable. I was telling the worship team earlier, we have no excuse now to not disciple each other. We have no excuse now to not be the center of outreach in southern Maine. We have no excuse now to not start praying and figuring out where God is going to have us plant our first church out of summit. We have no excuse now to fulfill and accomplish the vision that he has set before us with our eyes on Jesus. We have no excuse now. This is not a finish line. This is the start. That's why this is so significant. This chapter is closed. Now we go. Now we do. Don't get comfortable in these chairs that have the seat backs in front of them. We're going to move them as soon as service is over so that this thing can be used for the glory of God in this community. Don't get comfortable. And listen to me, in your individual life, family, don't get comfortable. Don't get to a place where you say, okay, God, I'm good. 
Because that's when he calls you to the most difficult thing you'll ever do. Don't get to a place where you say, okay, God, we're, we're all set. Like, go pick on Mike for a little bit. Run your race with your eyes on Jesus, looking to him, the founder and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him, come on, Dylan, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You know what the joy was that was set before Jesus on his way to the cross? You. Jesus died for you. That you may have life. That you might get to sit with us Sunday, May 14th of 2023. Jesus died for you. And not just that, but you were His joy that helped Him endure the whole thing. The verse that's really defined Summit over the last five years is Habakkuk 1.5. Habakkuk is having a conversation with God and basically says, God, where are you at? What are you doing here? You ever been in that spot? God, this medical thing, where are you at? What are you doing here? What are you trying to show me here? Where, where, you're, you're, not even, you're not even in the room. And so Habakkuk just voices his heart to God makes it makes it clear makes it known the first four verses of Habakkuk chapter one and then in verse five God responds to Habakkuk's prayer and says look see look at the nations see open your eyes I'm doing a work that you would not even believe if I told you So if there's things I could tell you today, it would be this. Pray for the presence of God and seek His glory. Don't stop because He's with you. You're not alone. Claim the victory in faith because it's yours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Claim that victory in faith because it's yours in Christ Jesus. And then lastly, run the race with your eyes fixed on Jesus because He loves you. And He's charted a race for you to run. Run it. Run it. And that is for us as a body and that is for you as an individual. We're going to signify this day by closing with communion. That night in the upper room, Jesus is with his disciples, knowing what's ahead of him, knowing the cross that's ahead of him, sitting on the floor, just marveling at every word Jesus was speaking. And Jesus took the bread and he broke it saying, this is my body, broken for you. Can you imagine being one of the disciples in that room? What that must have felt like, what that must have been like for this man who you've been following to sit before you and say, this is my body, this bread is my body, broken before you. And what bread meant, and what it still means really, provision. What Jesus was saying with the bread, that this is my body broken for you, he was saying, I'm enough. I always have been enough, and I always will be enough. You don't need me, Jesus, and anything. You just need me. I'm enough. My broken body is enough to cover you. It's enough to provide a way for you to God that you can have access to Him and spend eternity with Him because He promises in John 14 that He's gone to prepare a place for us. He's enough. And so God, as we're about to take this bread, this morning we claim You're enough for us.
you're enough. Thank you for the provision of your son whose body was broken on our behalf. We give him glory. In Jesus' name I pray. God bless you as you read. In the same place, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood. Poured out for you. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. I love how communion unites the body of Christ. You know why? Because it's Jesus. There, there's no, I mean, there's no, there's no music to disagree over when it comes to communion. There's no elements, right? I mean, I guess there is, because we could have real wine, right? And that would excite some of you. But it's a, it's, a, it's a drink, it's a bread, and it's symbolic of Jesus. Who died so that the church could be born because we're God's plan to save the world. With him as the center. Paul told the church at Corinth, we're ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal to the world through. at the center. So Jesus takes the cup. This is my blood poured for you. Why is that significant? Because nothing, nothing can cover the brokenness of your heart and my heart more than the love of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. He had to. He had to do this so that we could do this. I love the old song, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so as you drink this morning, I don't know what you've walked in here with today, but it's nothing the blood of Christ can't cover. I don't know what addiction you're battling today, it's nothing the blood of Christ can't cover. I don't know what unforgiveness and anger you're harboring today. It's nothing the blood of Christ can't cover. That's grace. And so God, thank you doesn't ever seem to be enough. But it's what we have. And so thank you for the blood of your son that covers us and that gives us the freedom to stand before you audaciously to expect big things from you and small things to face today tomorrow and the day after that God we need you thank you for offering freely the grace of your son Jesus. In his name we pray. God bless you as you drink. Woo. Amen. Let's pray one more time. Father, we give you all the glory for great things you have done and great thing, greater things are yet to come. And so we give you praise and we place you at the center. God, you've been there and that's why we're here. We're in your dust. And so we'll follow you. We're here we are. Send us. Direct our steps as your people. Corporately as summit for our guests, our friends, and for us as individuals, we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Love you, Summit. Have a great week.